viewers of my channel will recognize that I've previously done a Jeff Tranter style uh, documentary on the Heathkit IT2240 digital LC bridge, um, which was um, <clears throat> produced from about 1985 until 1990, and this is a 1989 catalog here, and sure enough on the test equipment pages is the IT2240. Really a surprisingly good original design from Heathkit engineers, and I mean surprisingly because most of the products in this price range would be missing some features or accuracy or utility in some way that made them cheaper than competing units not only in price tag but also in just general utility however this was kinda of like a jewel in their uh, production and sadly they only made it for about five years I still have mine it still does great service it remains in good calibration really a nice meter and um, I should point out that there are several ways to measure capacitance values which is probably the the primary use to which these are put even though they can also do inductance you know most circuits these days may have no inductors in them unless they're used for a switching power supply or if it's a radio circuit but other uh, modern circuits don't tend to have deliberate inductors in there other than of course just incidental inductance uh, so if you're looking at this as a primary capacitance type meter it's uh, going to use one of the two most common ways of measuring the capacitance and that's by either applying an AC waveform to a, a sinusoidal waveform um, and measuring its inductive impedance which is essentially what you get if you apply a constant AC voltage to a capacitor and then measure the current uh, you're going to get a uh, proportional current to the capacitance and that's because if you apply a high enough frequency AC sine wave to a capacitance its resistive component behaves along with its capacitive reactance as a big resistor and therefore the current just following Ohm's law is going to be proportional to that overall impedance and now the thing to keep in mind there is that the uh, resistive components going to respond in phase with the applied voltage whereas the uh, reactive part of it meaning the capacitance part its current is going to be out of phase by 90 degrees with the voltage and by measuring those two separately and isolating them and then subtracting the resistive part from the capacitive part or the purely resistive part from the uh, from the uh, reactive part you can come up with the actual current that's proportional only to the capacitance and then convert that to a voltage and apply it to a meter for a readout and that's the method that the IT2240 used so it's a much more sophisticated circuit and is going to give you pretty reliable accurate results and it can deal with components that may have unusual amounts of resistance to their overall impedance and still be able to isolate that and give you a true capacitance reading. Now here this is a spring and summer 1981 Heathkit catalog and uh, if we flip to the test equipment pages there's this relatively new instrument here and again this is a 81 uh, catalog so this was a new device because the IT2250 it's only uh, IT2250 compared to the 2240 I already mentioned here it is handheld capacitance meter uses advanced design 
for faster and more accurate digital readings. Uh, the IT2240 was up in the 300s of dollars to buy it. Quite a few parts, nice case and all that. This is considerably less expensive. But on the other hand, it's only a capacitance meter and it does not deal with inductance. The circuit is dedicated to measuring only capacitance. It doesn't uh, really take into account all the fineries of uh, measurement that the 2240 did. However, it's still a good yeoman duty um, capacitance meter with a nice digital display. I built one of these back probably shortly after it came out. It would have been the the mid um, or early-ish 1980s and mine never worked. <laughs> I mean it powered up, it gave a readout, but it was uncalibratable. Um, there was some problem with it and I was busy with a bunch of other things for work. I didn't really have a use for it. It was just something I built because I felt like building a kit and it looked kind of neat. I had a friend at that time who was unemployed and was just looking for something to keep himself busy and asked if he could take a look at it and he would do the troubleshooting just for yucks. Well, one thing led to another. Years went by and then I reminded him, hey, whatever happened to that meter? He didn't remember getting it. He couldn't find it. It was lost. Uh, so I've gone all those years and I've reacquired one now and since I've looked on YouTube and found absolutely no mention of the IT2250, I thought I would do a small documentary on this meter. Kind of a Jeff Tranter style um, documentary, as you may know. Jeff Tranter has a YouTube channel where he covers lots of vintage Heathkit test equipment and radio equipment and other things, and he's written a fine book on Heathkit test equipment. Uh, and I, I appreciate his style in covering those pieces of equipment. I'm not going to do it exactly like that, but I'm going to cover a lot of the types of things that Jeff did cover in his, if he had done one on the 2250. So anyway, um, so it's basically in the same housing as another Heathkit handheld, which was their digital volt ohm meter. And uh, I don't know if this was designed in house or not, but I, I suspect it was. Uh, one thing that I get a kick out of looking at this catalog is that it mentions Kevin connectors, polarized Kevin terminals. It says it somewhere else too. Ah, uh, yes, up here. Kevin terminal design. Um, that's supposed to be a Kelvin connector, which is just a type of connector used often for test equipment where there are two terminals for each component lead. One terminal for each lead is to apply a signal to the component and the other terminal is to read a signal from the component and thereby uh, negate a lot of issues you might have if you're using test leads and it deals with some other uh, common problems with measuring components accurately. So nicer test equipment tends to have Kelvin connectors and this piece of equipment, to its credit, uses them, and uses them correctly. So what does it say about it? It measures any capacitance automatically from 0 picofarads to 199 millifarads, not microfarads, but millifarads, which is 0.1999 farad, so pretty large values. Uh, it's auto-ranging, even the IT2240 was not auto-ranging, uh, so that's a big mark of sophistication. Automatically selects the correct range of measurement from a choice of 10 ranges, not just two or three, but 10 ranges. The capacitance reading is shown with the correct decimal point position, and then the, uh, the gross range is read out on four LEDs that mark uh, millifarads, microfarads, nanofarads, and picofarads. Uh, so we've already covered the Kevin connectors. Uh, it operates at a low voltage. It applies no more than two volts 
of uh, test voltage to the components and it's superimposed on a low bias voltage which is good for measuring electrolytic capacitors and you can also get a remote extension cable it actually came with the kit the one I obtained on eBay uh, from a seller in Beaverton Oregon which in case you don't know was a uh, uh, center of high technology manufacturing companies such as Tektronics being uh, located there and uh, for all I know the one I have may have belonged to an employee of a company like Tektronics. Anyway, so uh, it also has the ability to detect a leaky capacitor and there are two buttons for performing leakage tests. It's protected from excessive current by clamp diodes and a quarter amp fuse. And when the unit is turned off, there's a 2.2 ohm large wattage resistor across the input jacks, which can discharge any component that's plugged in there. Typical of Heath kit equipment, it came with a set of reference standard capacitors which are relatively stable capacitors pre-measured to a high degree of accuracy by Heathkit and shipped with the unit and then when you assemble it you just plug those in and calibrate it to match the reference components. The whole unit runs from a 9 volt battery and there is the option to run it off of a uh, a Walwart type power supply which does not come with it. It also had the option of coming with a leather carrying case, which mine did. The original one I had did not, but this new one from eBay did come with that, which is a nice feature to have, protects it nicely. The one I just obtained from eBay showed evidence of being used quite a lot, but carefully, probably by a professional or a very careful amateur. And uh, it was very nicely calibrated. I really didn't need to calibrate it, although I did obtain a new set of reference components. It did not come with the original ones. Uh, and I used a professional uh, capacitance meter to read those values and then check them on this meter. And only the highest value, which was a 1,000 microfarad reference capacitor, I needed to tweak this meter slightly to match the uh, the reading. But otherwise it was in very good calibration which is a another mark of confidence. Now I will mention that just later that same year the winter 1981 bridging to 1982 catalog it has a virtually identical well a virtually identical listing there's really the same paragraphs and everything. It looks like they really just copied it. However, somebody did notice that it's misspelled earlier and now it's a Kelvin connector. This, by the way, is Jeff Tranter's book on classic Heathkit electronic test equipment. A fine book. I'd highly recommend it. Here's another great book on Heathkit test equipment and it's called Heathkit Test Equipment Products by Chuck Penson. Uh, Chuck has a number of Heathkit books, not just test equipment, he also has one on Heathkit uh, audio equipment, you know, such as stereo sets, and he has one on uh, ham radios, and uh, he's also the former a curator of the Titan II Missile Museum near Tucson, Arizona, retired from that position, and he uh, is also author of a great book called the Titan II Handbook, by the way, and these are all available, I believe, on Amazon. Anyway, within this book, uh, under miscellaneous test equipment, is the IT2250 capacitance meter and it really just gives a, a recap of what was already mentioned in the the catalog pointing out that Heathkit curiously used millifarads uh, when 
usually the highest values used on electronics are still given as microfarads. And he points out that the 1.99.9 millifarad uh, maximum measurement on this meter is equivalent to 1,999.9 microfarads. Or maybe you don't need that 0.9 there, but uh, points out that the meter has plus or minus 0.2% accuracy if calibrated with a laboratory standard. And uh, he mentions the Kelvin connectors and that the testing voltage is 2 volts maximum and he suggests that the battery life is between 4 and 10 hours of continuous service that it displays a low battery indicator when the battery drops from 9 volts to 5 volts and uh, mentions that it was introduced in 1981 and discontinued in 1987 as usual for Heathkit, it has a large and complete manual. I don't want to go into every nuance of the manual, but uh, it has the usual excellent Heathkit assembly. Fine diagrams. Two different methods of calibration, either using the supplied reference standard components or laboratory standards method describes how to fabricate the add-on cable for connecting components that uh, won't fit into the Kelvin connectors and by the way this is the same extension cable that the IT2240 uses and since I uh, have one of that for my 2240 I know that it'll also work with this 2250 should I choose to do that. The operation is very simple because it's totally auto ranging. All you do is turn it on and plug in a component and it goes. It gives you the total ranges here of the 10 different ranges. Uh, reading from 0 to 199.9 picofarads. The next range is 1999 picofarads. Then it jumps to nanofarads with 19.99 maximum. Then to 199.9 maximum. 1.999 microfarads. 19.99 microfarads. 199.9 microfarads. 1999 microfarads. And then it jumps up into the millifarads. 19.99 and 199.9. So those are your 10 ranges. And there's a in case of difficulty section specifications. A theory of operation section which is more general without really citing specifics on this particular circuit and then a detailed circuit description citing individual um, IC and component numbers and pin numbers so you can follow along in the schematic. Then of course there is the circuit board x-ray views for all three circuit boards. There's the display circuit board which really just has the LCD drivers and um, one or two counter chips on it. There's the input circuit board which is primarily concerned with applying the charge signal to the capacitor in test and detecting what's going on with the charging of the capacitor. That's its primary function. Then there's a lot of logic to operate the meter and decide which range it should be in for auto ranging and that's handled primarily by the main circuit board. So think of it as an analog board, a digital board, and a display board. Component identification charts gives the Heath kit numbers, the kit component numbers, and the generic part numbers. Another auto ranging table 
And then as usual, it comes with a bunch of big fold-out uh, diagram sheets. There's an addendum sheet here, which is really only involving the, um, the extension cable. And then there's a big flow chart which treats the whole meter operation as if it's a, uh, a computer program, sort of, and gives you a flow chart of what happens next. And it's a big fold out. I'm not really sure how valuable that is, but. So that's the manual. I mentioned earlier that the preferred method of testing. Ca uh, I mentioned earlier that the preferred precision method of testing capacitors to determine their values is by working with them as impedances and applying an AC signal to them, which is necessary to do that. However, it is also possible to test capacitors for value by simply charging them with a DC voltage and seeing how long it takes to charge them, and then discharge them and see how long it takes to do that. And from that, you can learn what the capacitance value is, because if you charge them through a known resistor from a known voltage, you can time how long it takes to charge them from one voltage to another. And because of the uh, RC time constant, uh, you can calculate the, uh, the capacitance by simply measuring the time between one voltage and another of charging that capacitor. The IT2250 uses this latter method. It's simpler, you don't have to have all the AC circuitry, you don't have to uh, provide all the phase shift circuits and all that stuff. It's actually very simple. And if this meter was only going to have a manual ranging function, it could be very simple, it could fit on one circuit board. But because Heathkit decided to gussy this up with the auto ranging feature, it made it a lot more complicated. So I've made this simplified diagram here to show basically how the IT2250 works. There is a charge discharge circuit, which I'm just marking as the charge circuit here. There is a protection circuit, which is to protect the meter against weird voltages you might apply to the test terminals. There's some zeroing capacitors. Here's your Kelvin connectors. As I mentioned before, each lead of the component, and this is the capacitor under test, each lead plugs in and contacts two different contacts when it plugs in. And one of those is the drive signal, and the other one is the measurement signal. So. Uh, the bottom one here is the drive, the top one here is the drive, and then the ones in the middle are the measurements. And over here is a uh, resistor controller circuit, and down here is a comparator. And basically this circuit just sort of runs itself. The way it works is you've got a capacitor here, plugged in here and here, and over here, we're going to try to test the capacitor by charging it up and discharging it. There is a reference voltage of 2 volts. It's a precision regulated voltage. And the first thing you want to do is charge the capacitor. A logic circuit says we're going to use this charging circuit. It turns on. There are actually three charging circuits one for larger capacitance, one for medium, and one for smaller capacitors. So let's say the logic has detected we're going to use this particular charging circuit. So the logic turns it on, it turns this uh, PNP transistor on, which conducts, and there's always a pair of uh, transistors here, one's a PNP, one's an NPN, and the bases are logically tied together, although in the real circuit they're not electrically tied together, but functionally they are. So when one is turned on, the other one is turned off. So let's say this one's turned on. There is a calibration resistor. This is really the charge resistor. It's the trim pot that you use to calibrate it, and the voltage is applied here, and that causes a current to flow through the calibration resistor, 
through the protection fuse, through this part of the power switch, assuming the switch is on, past the zeroing capacitors, which adds, uh, they're basically connected in parallel because this capacitor here is between this point and ground. These capacitors are also between this point and ground. So they're all in parallel, but these are very small values. And you use this to zero out any characteristics of the meter that would give you an inaccurate reading. So anyway, we apply this charging current to the top of the Kelvin connector and it goes down to this capacitor which is connected to ground through the other Kelvin connector. So this capacitor starts charging up. Meanwhile, the measurement circuit here is basically being applied to a comparator IC. And the uh, high part of the signal is applied to the plus input and then something has to be applied to the minus output. In an, a normal comparator arrangement, this input would be tied to some, resi uh, some resistor divider or a voltage reference. And then whether this signal here is higher or lower than that reference, the output of the comparator will be on or off. So right now we're comparing against some voltage. This capacitor is charging up, so its voltage is increasing the plus input here is increasing. Meanwhile we have this voltage divider between our precision 2 volt supply. These are equal value resistors here and then those go back to ground essentially through the Kelvin connector. So normally there would be one volt halfway between 2 volts and 0 volts and that one volt would be applied to the negative input of the comparator. But in reality, the comparator outputs always a 1 or a 0 or on or off. And that's driving another pair of transistors, just like these over here, same kind and everything, a PNP and NPN pair. So one's always on, one's always off. Uh, and let's say that this transistor is turned on for argument's sake. Uh, that means that it's connecting this resistor, which is also the same value as these, it's connecting it in parallel with this one, which makes this value essentially half of what this is, and it's no longer one volt. It'll skew it down to uh, produce it maybe about 0.7 volts, 0.6 volts, somewhere in that area. If you turn this transistor on, then that shorts this one across this one, and now the preponderance of voltage will be on the bottom, so this reference here becomes 1.3 volts. So depending on which transistor is on, you either apply a 0.7 volt or a 1.3 volt reference to the minus input. So you're charging up and these transistors here have arranged to have a 1.3 volt reference. So when the capacitor is charged up to 1.3 volts, the flip-flop flips the other way and it changes which of these transistors is turned on and which one's turned off. Simultaneously, the signal comes over here and changes which of these two transistors is turned on. Previously this one was turned on, now this one will be turned on. So now it's taking the voltage on the capacitor and discharging it backwards through this circuit, backwards through the calibration resistor, through this transistor to ground. It's all the same component values, so it should be discharging at exactly the same rate that it charged. And the voltage on the capacitor starts falling. That means the input voltage, or the uh, comparator plus input voltage is dropping. And because these transistors have flipped, now it's trying to charge down to 0.7 volts. And therefore, the capacitor is basically doing this. This is your 2 volt reference. Here's 0 volts. Here's the 0 0.7 volt reference. Here's the 1.3 volt reference. The capacitor constantly charges up with that curve to the 1.3. Then the circuit flips. It discharges down to 0.7. The circuit flips again. It charges. Circuit flips again. It discharges. This goes on constantly without really anything to do with the rest of the meter circuit. So you end up with a very constant uh, reading of voltage 
as it's going back and forth between these and because the RC time constant is a known value when you're going through a fixed resistor from a fixed voltage the time that takes to go from here to here or here to here is directly proportional to the capacitance value. Meanwhile we have all this logic down here which it's too complicated to try to follow it uh, in this discussion so I've just simplified it here to blocks. You start out with a crystal oscillator 3.58 megahertz and that's applied to a big logic circuit and it's also applied to a frequency divider that divides by 10 uh, three times to give 358 kilohertz, 35.8 kilohertz, and 3.58 kilohertz. All four frequencies are available to the logic circuit. Meanwhile, the logic circuit is also aware of whether we're in a charge or a discharge state, and therefore it can synchronize its operations to the charging and discharging. And essentially what it's doing is it's figuring out by a very simple expedient what the capacitor value is and which range it should be in. So it always starts out assuming that it's going for a low value and so it sets up in logic it has uh, control over the uh, the range and it has control over which of these frequencies it uses and it basically just runs this one of these frequencies into a chain of counters that figures out the units, the tens, and the hundreds, and then a flip-flop for the last digit, which can be either zero or one. And it just charges this up during this cycle, and then does it again when it discharges and repeats and repeats. If it's charging up at its initial frequency, and the counters overflow, in other words, they count up to one point or one nine nine nine, which is as high as they can count, and they overflow. That's saying that the capacitance value is larger than thought, so that feeds back into this circuit and it shifts gears. It switches up to the next of those ten auto ranges that it has, and that involves sending a new command to the display to change where the decimal points are. It may change which of the four LEDs are on to tell you which range it's in. And it certainly changes which frequency it's using. And then it does it again. It just keeps running this circuit now with a different uh, frequency being applied to the counters. And it'll try that. And if it still overflows, it'll shift it again. And it keeps doing that until none of those work and it's still overflowing it says ah this must be an even larger capacitor than we thought and now it commands from this output here the charge circuits I mentioned before there's actually three charge circuits this part of it here the rest of this is always constant it'll send logic to turn off one of these charge circuits and then it'll turn on the next charge circuit and the only difference is that there's a different pair of transistors and a different calibration series resistor to use. So now it'll try charging the capacitor through that different value of resistor and it goes back and switches down to the uh, the first frequency and tries it again and every time it overflows it shifts up through either the changing the charge circuit therefore the charge rate or it changes the frequency that's being applied to the counters and it keeps doing that until it essentially can't count any higher and you've reached that uh, 199 uh, millifarad value which is as high as it can go. So that's the basic method that the uh, capacitor tester uses and uh, you end up with each time it does that, every time it repeats this cycle it ends up with a value in these counters and it's just been counting uh, this high frequency signal and then it sends that down to the display and displays the correct uh, digits on the LCD display and I also mentioned earlier that
as it shifts gears, it's changing from the picofarad LED to the uh, nanofarad LED to the microfarad LED to the millifarad LED. Some things which I didn't really show here is there are some extra sophistications. The circuit can detect when a capacitor has first been plugged in and it runs this part of the circuit a little differently for its initial charge because it's assumed that the capacitor is going to be starting at zero volts. So it's not going to be doing this and this and this initially. It's going to be doing a different charge all the way up from zero volts to 1.3 volts. And therefore that first charge is invalid and cannot be used and the circuit basically ignores the first charge discharge cycle. So it's got logic to detect that. Uh, all the other logic is really associated with shifting the gears here, changing which frequency it counts, and changing which charge discharge circuit it's using. And that's really about all there is to the meter circuit. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't at least briefly go over the schematic. It's going to show the same things I already showed. It even has a little a waveform just like I described it, having an initial charge and then charging down, charging up, charging down, charging up between these d different uh, reference voltages. Here's the capacitor under test. Here are the Kelvin connectors. Here's the zeroing array of capacitors. Here's the switch which determines whether you're going to put a shunt resistor to ground to discharge the capacitor or whether you're going to connect through the fuse to the over voltage protection circuit. And I didn't really mention that. I kind of glossed over it in the previous diagram. There's a diode from here to ground and that protects the meter against reverse voltages. And then there is a, uh, this is off the two volt supply here, and it goes to a five volt zener, which obviously doesn't do anything because it's not uh, applying enough voltage to even get the zener doing anything. Uh, but if you apply a capacitor that has a charge on it of more than two volts, it's going to forward bias this diode and through this limiting resistor back to the 2 volt power supply it's going to clamp the voltage um, to a 2 volt maximum. Then finally there's a 5 volt zener from here to ground and that's going to say well if for some reason the voltage here exceeds 5 volts which it could if the meter is turned off when a capacitor with a charge on it is plugged in it'll still forward bias this diode and then the zener will turn on and short the capacitor to ground thereby discharging it. So there's really three different protections right here in addition to the fuse. Here are the two transistors that are used to flip-flop the threshold voltage for the, comparison, uh, for the comparator and there's one of its resistors, there's the other one and here's the one it puts in parallel with this one or this one. Then here you have the three different charging discharging circuits. They're all identical except for the values of the resistors that you adjust to control the charging current. And these are controlled by logic just down here. All they're really doing is taking the output of the comparator and using it to flip the circuit to charge or discharge and the reason AND gates are used here is to be able to turn on one of these charge circuits and turn the other two charge circuits off by bringing in control signals from all this logic down here. Then this is the 2 volt power supply up here. It just uses three diodes in series as a reference and then it uh, uses a pass transistor to supply a uh, charge discharge 2 volt reference. So that's the power supply. Here's a couple of flip-flops that are used for finer details than I covered in my brief overview. And this here is the extra two switches for the leakage ratio 
uh, measurements. Up here are the four range LEDs and their driver transistors and they're just driven out of all this logic down here. Now over here is the power supply. Uh, the battery here comes down, it goes through the power jack so if you have a external power supply plugged in it'll disconnect the battery and then it runs it back to this board and through the power switch and then back to this board and through a three terminal voltage regulator and then there are a couple of auxiliary transistors that are used here for things like low voltage detection which can be indicated on the display here's your uh, crystal oscillator circuit and here are the uh, divide by 10 circuits that produce those four different frequencies that I mentioned earlier and those frequencies are all fed into this logic down here. Now there's a counter here which counts up through the different ranges and that's the counter whose job it is to figure out which range you should currently be in. And then there's a 1 of 10 decoder here which is just used to drive all these gates. So the logic for the auto ranging is primarily done right here and with all of these gates here. There is a latch which is used to latch in the current range and it's also used to latch in a minus sign on the display. The backplane on LCDs needs to be driven from a varying voltage, usually an AC voltage or a pulsed DC voltage is applied and no different with this LCD display. So all they do is they take a uh, a source here that they're stealing from the oscillator and they're bringing it over here and running it into the back plane of the display so they're borrowing a handy high frequency divided down frequency as a back plane driver. There's a flip-flop that's used to lock in range changes um, as detected by the range change gate. There are some fineries of making this circuit actually work well which are dealt with by a few flip-flops here. I didn't really get into those, they're kind of in the weeds. Uh, there's a bit of logic here that determines when it's time to load uh, values from the counters into the display drivers. And that's because sometimes you don't want the display to update. You don't want the display to be rippling. As the counters are quickly counting, you don't want the counters to be going brrrr, you know, through the numbers. That's just distracting. So you've got these display drivers up here. And even though the counters are rapidly counting up, you have to determine when they finally counted and then load the output of the counters into the display drivers so they can update the display. So there's a bit of logic here that determines when it's time to do that. And then here's your units counter. And then there are two more stages of counters in this chip here. It's a dual BCD counter. That takes care of the other two digits. So units, tens, and hundreds are done in these two chips. And then there's a flip-flop somewhere on here. I think it's this one right here, which is used to act as, yeah, it's the 1K that one that's all by itself in the display. You don't need a counter for that, you're just saying that you've overflowed the previous digit and that's handled with this flip-flop. So that's essentially your uh, thousands counter, if you will. Let's see what else is on here. So we covered the display, this logic, that logic. You know, this is all just selection logic here, that's why it's just simple gates. There's a power-up circuit that resets everything on here, all the flip-flops and resets all the counters and everything whenever the circuit is powered up so it all starts out in a coordinated way. Oh yeah, and then there's also control of the decimal points. This circuit over here takes care of the ranges, but you have to decode that to determine which decimal point needs to be turned on at any given moment. So there's a decimal point and 1K latch chip here. And through these gates, it determines um, 
how the decimal point should operate and it sends those down these lines. There's a, a signal here related to the 1K reading and then the uh, back plane is again referenced here coming off of the uh, back plane drive circuit which is also tied well I already mentioned that. So that's an overview of the schematic. Okay, so this is what the meter looks like inside. There's your Kelvin connectors. And this area here is all the uh, capacitive and resistance adjustments. And uh, then the transistors around here are all the charge and discharge capacitors and really the whole front end of this meter is on this board so um, I think you probably got one of the flip-flops and the comparator chips up here it would make sense for it to be there but I didn't actually trace it out um, then there's a couple of components down here which are basically part of the network into which the Kelvin connectors are well they're part of that network so you've got a large value discharge resistor you've got a couple of uh, other capacitors which are in series and or parallel uh, connections and uh, then up here you've got the driver circuit for the uh, range LEDs and the LEDs themselves and of course the the basic power on switching and the uh, two leakage test switches but there's not that much to those and those are actually wired out right over here by the connector that um, goes to the other circuit board so uh, there's really no circuitry on this board for these two switches it's all they're just wired over here and then there are circuits on the other board um, I'm not gonna discombobulate this too much because uh, some of these older products once you start flexing their old flex connectors and things things start breaking and then it stops working and this is working really well so I don't wanna push my luck but I do remember from when I built this uh, meter originally, not this specific one, but the one I had that was like this in the uh, early 80s. Um, they really jammed it in here about as much as they realistically could, you know, to the point of having ICs and circuits underneath those buttons like that. You've got this circuit board here, then you've got the circuit board for the display which has ICs on the back of it, several of them actually, three or four I think. Then you've got the main circuit board down here you can see that's just full of parts. But again I'm not going to take that off. I'm worried about the connectors breaking either for the display or the um, the interboard connectors. But that's about what it looks like. I did decide to pull the uh, board out of there um, get a little better look at some of this. There's your uh, voltage regulator. Back of the board, whoever did this did a decent job of soldering. There's almost all digital logic on the bottom board. with uh, most of the analog stuff on the top board. That's why it's surrounded by this shield which wraps around the top board but not the bottom board. They really packed it in here. If they needed one more chip in here I think they would have been in trouble. Alright, well here's the actual artifact the IT2250 in its glory. Pretty handsome meter, kind of old-fashioned by today's standards, but at the time this came out in the uh, in the 80s, uh, 
pretty much every digital multimeter and everything looked just about like this. It was real common to have these side buttons on them that you could just push in with one hand. Um, so you're presumed to be holding it like this and now you're operating the buttons with your fingers. I don't know how many people actually use that and I think that's why most of the current meters don't do it that way. It's just awkward. But uh, LCD display, your four range LEDs, two buttons for the leakage test, your uh, coarse zero control, actually I think that may be the fine zero control. I think that's the fine zero control. There's a trim pot or a trim capacitor. It's a trim capacitor inside the meter that's used for coarse fine control and obviously you shouldn't have to adjust that very often, that's why it's inside the meter. There's your power button. There are your two Kelvin connectors. And it drives me nuts that plus is on the right. It seems like most meters plus will be on the left. And I keep almost plugging in electrolytics backwards in here. But it has the usual obligatory discharge capacitor before connecting. If you plug in one that's charged, the protection circuit will kick in and hopefully do it before it does any damage, but it'll probably blow the fuse in doing so. Even my 2240 here has a similar caution, as does another uh, capacitance meter that I also have a video on, actually two videos, the XTEC LCR200. It also has the same caution. You're going to see that on pretty much any piece of test equipment into which you plug devices that can have a charge on them, which is capacitors. Uh, so all of that's well and good. There's the uh, power jack on the side for your external power supply. As was common at this time, uh, eighth inch phone connectors were all the rage for this type of thing. Nowadays nobody uses those for power. It's always a barrel connector or these days more likely to be USB, but a barrel connector is still common. They were using the older style uh, connector on here, and there's a little rubber barrier here to keep dirt out, but it still has a small stretchy hole in the rubber barrier there. Here's a side view. And here's the back. The cover's held on with three screws and a handy pull to get the kickstand out. And then there's handy information on the battery type and the fuse type. So, let's turn it on. always starts with the lowest value, so it's down on the picofarads with the decimal point pretty close to the right hand side. So uh, this is a reference capacitor here. This is um, supposed to be 150 nanofarads. Checked at 1 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz. And uh, let's plug it in. and it auto-ranged to the nanofarads and pops 150 up there. It's just dead nuts on. Now just for yucks, let me plug it into the IT2240. Pretty much agrees. Let's try a small electrolytic out. This is supposed to be 150 microfarad, but it actually tested at uh, 155 microfarads. Uh, again, I have to remember which side's the minus and which side's the minus on the meter. It auto ranged to microfarads and it's 155. Dead knots on. Let's try the other meter. Well, this isn't auto-ranging. I have to change the range here to 200 microfarad range. This one's coming in a little bit high. Uh, it's reading 156. 
but still pretty much there. And then uh, this is a thousand microfarad, which is testing at uh, 1,012 microfarads. Pretty much right there, just uh, the lowest digit is kind of drifting around, but really spot on. Let's try it on this guy. And I have to change the range again because this is not auto ranging. Go to the 2000 microfarad range. And again, it's slightly high, but it's pretty much there. So this meter is doing its job and it's working just about perfectly. Notice that it seems to always have the minus sign on when there's nothing connected. It's not really reading a minus value, but that's what it does when there's no value. So that's really an indication not that there's a minus, it's just that you know you can't believe anything the meter's telling you at this point. When that minus sign goes away, you know it's giving you what it thinks is a good solid reading. So nice clear display, nice clear readouts here. The auto range works perfectly. And uh, due to the fact that it's using different charge circuits and different count rates, different count frequencies, which is not a test frequency. There is no test frequency per se on here. It's charging and discharging through those circuits, but it's not being fed a frequency. Um, so this is a fairly large value here, and plugging it in, it takes, what, about a second to auto range. So you have to think what actually happened there. It started out in the picofarad range, and it went through however many, you know, three different ranges in the picofarads, decided all those were too low, did the same thing with two or three ranges in the nanofarads, and then kicked up into the microfarads. And this can't, I don't think this is the lowest microfarad range, so it had to go through that too. And uh, can you imagine if the frequency of the counter was always the same, this could take forever. But because it's not only shifting the charge circuits, it's also checking, shifting the uh, counter frequency, that is a good move here to allow it to always get very speedy uh, readouts. Now let's uh, go back and look at this big capacitor here and check it for leakage. So the meter isn't sophisticated enough to read out actual leakage values. That would take a whole other big chunk of circuitry which they didn't have room for in here. So what they do instead is have you take two different readings and you get a number that's still a capacitance value of sorts, but it's skewed, and you're supposed to compare the two different numbers you get from the two buttons. And on larger electrolytic capacitors, which is the ones you're really worried about for leakage anyway, you should get numbers that are roughly half of the value when you push uh, the button. So it's reading around 1,000. I push this in, and it's reading about 500, so 512. Let's try the other button. The switch was a little sticky there. I had to try it a couple of times, but now it's working. So 497 versus 512. According to the manual, those two numbers should be within 5% of each other. The numbers we had were uh, 512 and 497, and those are within 5% of each other. For example, if I take 512 and subtract 5%, I end up with 487, which is uh, close enough to the 497 range I got there. So um, they're pretty close. Now you can u actually use a nomogram, which is in the manual. So you've got uh, different ranges, and you're supposed to read the capacitance value from this value, select the correct range, A, B, or C on the nomogram. So it's a thousand microfarads. Uh, so I was in range C. So let's try this again.
So button 1 gives me the number 1 value, and that's 509 versus, come on switch, switch is a little noisy there, 494. Five oh nine versus four ninety three. The first reading by the second one, I don't think it really matters which one you do, but let's divide five oh nine by the lower value or the second value, uh four ninety three, and that gives me a one point zero three ratio. So you're supposed to project ratio reading up to curve. So anyway, you get these two values. Come on, button. The contacts are a little flaky on this switch. And you get the other reading. You use your calculator or whatever to take the ratio of the two, and you make sure the ratio is flipped so that it's a number kind of in this range here. And then you follow that number up to the curve and then go left and reading off the correct range you're supposed to be able to get a leakage resistance in ohms. The switches are giving me kind of flaky results because I don't think they've probably ever been used. It's something you're not likely to use under normal usage. And other than the power switch, these are the only ones that actually have a signal going through their contacts. So I may not even be getting valid readings from this, but that's the sort of, I don't want to say half-assed, but sort of a half-assed way that this meter kind of sort of accounts for leakage. Now I don't know if there's much else I can say about this meter other than that brief demo. There is one little bit of information I gleaned from the back of the manual. I know that I got this from a seller in the Beaverton, Oregon area. And uh, there's an invoice for purchase of the unit. And uh, the address is scribbled out, so I'm not going to try to go there. But at one point it was taken into the Heathkit Electronics Center in Vancouver, Washington, and they uh, replaced the LCD, would not operate at typical rack plane frequency calibrated to factory references. So this was done in 1981, so probably right after it was built. And it shows here that this was in Aloha, Oregon, which I gather is somewhere up in that neck of the woods. Anyway, this is typical of what you'd get if the kit you built did not work or had a faulty part and you took it into a Heathkit electronics center. They would uh, repair it, write up what they found, what they did, and indicated it was under warranty and uh, no charge. Personally, I only had, I think, one kit that I ever built out of really hundreds of Heathkits I built and uh, only one of them had to be taken into an electronic center and that was one of the oscilloscopes I built actually had a diode that was mismarked on the diode and one of the power supplies in the scope did not work so the scope would not work and I was checking everything and rechecking it but one thing I didn't do was actually hook up meters to the diodes to see if the diodes were working I just assumed they were brand new and they would and that was my mistake. I took it into the Heathkit Electronics Center and the technician, uh, I think it was the same day I took it in, called up and said, your scope is fixed. I said, what was it? He said, you had a diode in backwards. I said, I checked that very carefully. He said, well, the diode was in backwards, but it was marked incorrectly from the factory. So you put it in the way it looked correct, but it was actually in backwards. So they usually did a pretty good job of that. I mentioned that I had my earlier 2250 that I built that seemed to have a problem that I never completely was able to resolve before I ran out of patience. My friend took it and never did fix it, but 
This one here was obviously built well. The soldering is all good. The assembly is nice and clean. It had a defective LCD as it was indicated. Heathkit replaced that for him, calibrated it for him, and presumably he would use this for a long time. I've cleaned the case up a lot. There were actually uh, stamps on here and things which I've been able to erase without marring the surface too much. By the way, here's the uh, really nice Heathkit uh, leather case. It's nice heavy leather, real solid, well built. AW Enterprise, Chicago. So they just fit in there like that. And then the case snaps shut. And you've got your carrying handle. And I'm really happy to have this back in my collection of vintage Heathkit test equipment. I hope you found this video interesting.